Well, before we get started, it is rifle season, and uh, I'm getting phone calls of elk being on the ground. And uh, I got a phone call yesterday from a dear friend, and uh, he said, when I got a phone call from him, he, he never calls me, like, physically on the phone. And, and I said, where are you at? How much help do you need? How bad is it? He's like, are you willing? I said, yes. And so I came out there and, and helped. He said, he said it was two miles before you start heading up the ridge, and it's just over the ridge. Yeah, right. <laughs> if anybody ever tells you the distance on an elk, they're lying. And just remind them, liars fry, OK? Liars fry. <laughs> anyway, I went out there and, and, and helped, had a, had a great time. Uh, they, they had a six-point bull on the ground, um, had it all quartered up. And uh, I put a bunch of weight on my back and carried it back. Uh, it wound up being four miles from the vehicle walking to the, to the elk <laughs> and four miles back to the vehicle with weight. And uh, about, that about did me in. My hips are bruised. My shoulders hurt. But I love it. And I do it again today. Well, just so happens, I got a phone call this morning from, <laughs> from Randy and uh, Lyman Jessup. And, and Randy, he never calls me. OK, these guys don't call me on the phone. And, and he ca called me, and I, I was like, well, it's Randy. I said, where are you at? How bad is it? <laughs> he said, it's not so bad, but are you preaching today? I said, yes, and you should be in church. <laughs> you know what they say about killing something on a Sunday. Their church gets 10%. I said, how bad is it? He said, well, we got two elk down. We both killed bulls. I said, oh my gosh. I said, please tell me you got help coming. He said, yeah, I just wanted to call and make you feel bad. <laughs> I said, well, you've done it. And so I said, call me after church and, and let me know how, how it goes and I'll see where you're at. Anyway, God's doing good. What's that? Get your 10%. Yeah, I got to go get my 10%. That's where I'm going after church. I'm going to go collect my hind quarters and back straps. That's the Lord's. Amen. God's good, church. He's faithful, and uh, the Lord is blessing uh, church families. I couldn't be more proud and more happier, and uh, man, I just, I live for packing out elk. I'm telling you, I mean, Jesus is number one. I mean, my wife and Grace, and then there's elk. Sorry, Mike and Denise. <laughs> but I'm so, I'm so grateful, and, uh, and God has certainly blessed me and uh, bless the church, and it just brings me joy and such joy to, to hear people be successful in the woods, providing for their family. And God is God's favor and protection over all of them. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, got that off my chest. Lord, may your spirit fall today. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Everyone bow your heads and close your eyes. Let's open up in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come join us today. This is all about you. Father God, we praise and we thank you for the anointing. For the name of Jesus that is above every name. Lord, we just submit ourselves to your word. We open our hearts to receive this morning. Father God, make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. This morning we're going to be talking about Jesus the King. Amen? Amen. Does that sound good? Yeah. Jesus the King. We're going to be talking about who he is as our King. The things that he has done. This is going to bless you. Amen? In Revelations 19 and verse 16, and uh, speaking of Scripture... Um, you can turn there, hold your finger on there. I'm going to just blow through scriptures today, okay? And so those of you that, uh, I, I always, I, I never, I didn't hate, but I didn't enjoy preachers that uh, just blew through scriptures Well, I'm doing it. <laughs> and uh, you can hear this on, online um, next week uh, for scripture references. I'm going to have you turn to two specific scriptures this morning, but just open your hearts to receive this. Um, if you're a fast writer, you can write down these scripture references as they come. But uh, Revelations 19 and verse 16, it says this, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. On his garment, he wears this name. On his clothes, it's printed on his name. I believe it's printed in blood. Amen. On his robe, this is written. On his thigh, it is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Why the thigh? Well, the only thing I can think of is your thighs represent foundation, right? Yeah. They carry you into battle and also walk you down an aisle for a wedding, right? Yeah. Mm. There's a great and glorious wedding coming, yes. amen? And God is looking for a pure and spotless bride. We're not there yet, but we're striving every day to be more like yeah. Jesus, amen? Yeah. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords, hallelujah. One of the most comforting truths you will ever lay hold of is the truth that Jesus is king. Everyone say, Jesus is king. Jesus. 
Now, if you haven't noticed, this world is in absolute chaos. There's pandemics, there's fear, there's hatred, there's racial unrest. A culture of dishonor is plaguing our countries. There's nuclear threats popping up all over the globe. If you haven't noticed, resources are scarce. And amazingly, even the, in the most modern times, many people lack sufficient food and water. And countless people die of thirst and starvation every day, while at the same time, space programs are spending millions on missions we know nothing about. AIDS has claimed millions around the world. There's genocide, there's wars, there's conflict breaking out between nations. Terrorism has once again become a very real force. Children are growing up faster than ever before, being exposed to alternative lifestyles that were never before accepted by our society. There's families breaking up at an insane rate. This world is facing massive recessions. Jobs are disappearing. Homes are being lost to foreclosures. Parents who once spent their weekends at country clubs and shopping malls have lost everything. And for many people, this is a very difficult and scary time to be alive because nothing is certain. And the greatest advisors have made devastating errors in judgment. But church, don't get me wrong, we should pray for our leaders, but to be honest, it's extremely difficult to have trust in men and women these days. And when you put all these factors together, you pile them all up, you will have complete and absolute fear and total uncertainty for the future. There's no doubt about it. People don't know who to believe or who to trust. So what promise of hope do we have today? Well, I'm glad you asked. Are you ready for this? The Bible explains it perfectly well by saying this in Acts 17 and verse 7. There is another king, one called Jesus. Hallelujah. There is another king, one called Jesus. Be confident, church, that King Jesus is our greatest and only hope today. Hallelujah. You see, in the United States, we have city, county, and state and federal leadership. And we submit and honor those that are in office, no doubt. But, and we thank them for their service. However, let me make something very clear. The moment that you give your heart to Christ, he becomes your king. Psalms 103 and verse 19. You can just write this down. The Lord has made the heavens his throne. Psalms 103 and verse 19. He has made the heavens his throne, and from there he rules over everything. No other king has the power and the glory of Jesus. There is none more beautiful who lives in a more magnificent palace. Who else can call the heavens his throne and the earth his footstool? None other but Jesus. Say, that's my Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. He is above any human leadership regardless of their position. And as followers of the Lord... We are obligated to be peaceful and law-abiding citizens, as Romans 13 and verse 1 talks about. However, when he shows up in your life, you become a part of a new system, which is both different and higher than the world's way. And the Son of God is greater than any form of government, and so is his kingdom. And the Bible refers to him as the ruler of the kings of the earth. In Revelations chapter 1 and verse 5, it speaks of this. And this tells us that Jesus reigns above any dictator, tyrant, president that fall underneath that category or king of this world. He and his kingdom are not under any authority by any human, but it is actually the other way around. And you can have peace today. You can have peace in the fact that regardless of what happens on this planet, you do not have to be afraid. You do not have to walk in fear. No doubt things will become more unstable and chaotic as Christ's return approaches. But regardless of of who the world appoints in leadership, the Bible teaches that the world's way and system will be shaken and that sin and gross darkness shall cover the earth, as Isaiah 60 and verse 2 talks about. And if Jesus is your king, it becomes his responsibility to take care of you. That's right. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Are you his this morning? Yes. Then it's his responsibility to take care of you. Right and guess what? I'm going to tell you something you might not know. He will. Right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. In John 16 and verse 3, you can just write this down. Actually, mm, yeah, let's turn there. John 16, 3, if you have your Bibles. This is good. John 16, 3. I'm, I'll read this out of the New King James Version. It says this, I have told you these things so that in me, in Christ, you may have peace. In who do we have peace? In Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble. Don't you know it? But take heart, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. On the other hand, if we make the mistake of following the values that society has embraced, you will experience the consequences it is now facing and will continue to face. So what do we do? That's a great question. 
you humbly receive the Lord as king of your life, then you will experience the peace of knowing that you can trust him to be the faithful king he promised to be every single time. Amen? Amen. Let's look at for, for a moment at the difference between Jesus and the world system. Nothing can be more opposite than Jesus and the world system. Right. He said in John 18 and verse 36, you can just write that down. John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world, but now my kingdom is from another place. And I want to show you the comparison of what King Jesus says and what the world will tell you. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Jesus says, love your enemy. Yeah. The world will say, let your enemy suffer. If somebody attacks you with hate, Christ says, turn the other cheek. The world tells you, hit back harder. When you lack money or food, Jesus says, give and it will be given. The world replies, you can't help anyone at this time. Put yourself first. God's way is to treat the poor no different than the rich. But the world gives honor and uh, privilege to those with large bank accounts. Jesus says, when you do a charitable deed, do it in secret. The world's way is to draw attention to yourself. Jesus says, if you lose your life, you will gain it. The world's advice is to follow whatever makes you happy in life. Jesus says, it is better to give than to receive. The world puts pressure on the pursuit of possessions. Jesus, the great physician, says, I will come and heal. The world says, this disease will kill you. In Jesus' kingdom, we are to take the lowest rank and serve, as Luke 22 states. In the world's eyes, you use your authority to be served. Right. You see, the world system profits self, promotes self. In God's kingdom, however, we honor him by looking away from ourselves. Why would you want to trust in a failed world system instead of King Jesus? Yes. Amen? You see, a lot of people wonder, what is the kingdom of God? We've been asked this question before. What is the kingdom of God? And some have dedicated their entire lives to this topic. Their work has been informative and helpful, but let me make something simple. The kingdom of God is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's the kingdom of God. Yes. It's Jesus Christ. And to find out what the kingdom is like, we need to just take a look at the life of Christ. It is Him. And when he began his ministry, he made a statement that would describe his next three and a half years. He declared in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17. You can just write that down if you'd like. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. He was saying, listen, get ready for a transformation. There's a transformation coming. And Jesus could truthfully say this, that God's kingdom was near because the king was present. He was standing in their midst, King Jesus. And if he had not come to the earth, the kingdom of God would have never been made known. And there can be no kingdom without a king. Jesus makes the kingdom what it is. Hallelujah. Joseph, who provided the tomb for Christ's body, he was waiting for the kingdom of God, as Mark 15, 43 states. And this man discovered the kingdom when he found Jesus the king. Hallelujah. And if you only learn about the system of the kingdom and never meet the king himself, you will come away empty and disappointed every time. He is the beauty and the majesty of the kingdom. The kingdom is the king. Glory to God. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You see, today, some countries still operate as kingdoms. They are ruled by kings and queens. Even though their citizens live their, their entire lives in this kingdom, they never have a single moment to speak to their ruler. They never have a chance to see the king in person, let alone have a private audience with him. And even if they did, their time with them would be very brief. Our savior is no ordinary king. I said, our Savior is no ordinary king. And the Bible shows us just how accessible he is. We are told in Mark 10 and verse 14. You don't have to turn there. Mark 10 and verse 14. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was troubled. He said to them, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. Good. You all have seen kids, how excited they get, how innocent they are, how, how precious and, uh, and uh, you know, holy uh, they are, really. I mean, when they're in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. They wanted, they wanted Jesus. They wanted to come to him. That's why Jesus says, come to me. These children, they have, they have uh, childlike faith. I mean, you can get kids to believe anything, right? He said, have that childlike faith. Let them come 
to me. And not only did he take the time for the adults, he opened his arms to the children and he blessed them. There is no other leader who rules with such love and tenderness. There is none other. Christ is the greatest and most majestic king, yet he still offers us all the access we want to him. And we have an open door to his chamber, as the Song of Solomon says in chapter 1 and verse 4. The Lord not only gives us entrance, but he also gives us the privilege of making personal requests regarding our lives. Turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. I just love this. We could preach on this over and over and over again. This is out of the NIV I'm, I'm reading. It says, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. With, with what? Confidence. confidence. Okay, the throne of grace with confidence, with boldness, other translations say. So that you may receive mercy. What do you receive? Mercy. And find grace. What do you find? Grace. To help us in our time of need. Did you know you got the key to the gate? What's the key? Jesus. He made the way. He gave you the key. There's too many Christians that are beaten on the throne room door trying to get in. And and Jesus is like, it's open. (laughs) Come in. Amen. Have confidence. Let me read this again. Let us then approach the throne of grace, his throne, the feet of Jesus, with confidence, with boldness. You got the key. It's your home. Go in so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. How many of you all need grace and mercy in your time of need? So approach the throne with confidence, amen, and receive these things. He listens to us time and time again as we pour our hearts out to him, and he is never too busy to meet with us. Isn't that amazing? He is never too busy to meet with us, but he hears us pour our hearts out to him over and over again. Imagine if God treated us the way that we treat him. Hear me out now. Imagine this. This is probably how it, would, it, it uh, goes a lot of time. Imagine if God treated you the way that you treat God. You would come to him and you, and, uh, you say, God, I just, I just need to meet with you. Lord, I, just, I, just, I need wisdom on this situation. I need some guidance. Lord, I just ask that you come and, and be with me. Speak wisdom to me. And the Lord shows up and he says, you know what, Pastor Jesse, I love you. I mean, you're doing great. You're, I mean, you're doing great. But uh, I'm, I'm a little busy. My plate's full. And uh, man, the Middle East, it's chaos. I'm trying to keep the world from falling apart. It's really, it's shaken. I don't know why, but it's shaken. And uh, you know, there's a lot of people in front of you. They, they ask before you. I mean, there is a list. And, uh, but I mean, I apologize. Sorry, but not sorry. But I'll try to get back, back with you. Can I take a rain check? Um, all right. Thanks for understanding. Okay, bye. How, many, how often do we come to God we have a busy day, we as humans and uh, family, uh, family members fill our schedules up so full we hardly have time to breathe. We hit, our, we hit the pillow at, at night and we're like, what just happened today? I mean, and, and if there's a spare moment in our schedule, man, we pack it, we fill it. Oh, we have a window, let's put something else there. No, why do we do that? We do that to our kids too. I'm preaching now. And so we, we wind ourselves up in situations where we have zero time for God, zero time to meet with him. And we do this to God all the time. I mean, I even do this to God. And I hit my, my head on the pillow at, at night and I, and I go, oh, God, I didn't meet with you today. I didn't even read your word. Lord, I've been so busy. I don't even know if I thought about you today. Father God, forgive me. I love you. Bless my sleep in Jesus' name. And that's what we say. And God's like, all right. Right? Who else can relate to this? But God, he's so loving, and he is so royal and so accessible that he listens to us time and time again as we pour our hearts out to him, not giving him a moment to respond, and he is never too busy to meet with us. But we're so often too busy to meet with him. Imagine how that makes God feel. Imagine how you would feel if God treated you that way. Oh boy, I'm heavy tonight, or this morning, I'm heavy. We can actually go to the king of the kingdom and ask for help. We can go to him and ask for help. And the Bible talks about if we ask in accordance to his will, that he promises to grant it. Thank you, Jesus. What is his will, church? What's his will? His word. All right. What's his will? His word. That's right. That's right. You never have to wonder what the will of God is. It's his word. 
What could possibly be more awesome than having a loving invitation from the ruler of the universe to come and spend time with him? Yeah. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Let me ask this question. Do you have accessibility to the leaders of your state or country whenever you would like? No. Can you go straight to your leader and spend as much time with them as you wish? No. Jesus wants more than anything to spend time with you than you can ever imagine. But there is one more question worth considering. Would your leader die for you? No. No. No, he would not. Many citizens shed their blood for their leaders and their country, but only one king. One king has ever died so that you could spend eternity with him in his kingdom forever. Only one king. That is King Jesus. Jesus had to answer belittling questions regarding his position as king. Both religious and government leaders forced him into humiliating situations, but he never ran from these situations. In fact, he embraced these moments of humiliation. At one point, he was standing on trial before the religious leaders and the Roman officials, and he knew his time, the time of his death, was quickly approaching. And after being accused of calling himself king, Pilate, the governor of Judea, asked him directly. He said this in John 18, verse 33. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. John 18, 37. And this may seem just like another account of what happened while he was on trial, but there's a much deeper meaning here that we have to see. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal the weight of this moment to us. Christ looked nothing like a king in this hour. You have to realize this. He had not slept all night. Perhaps he, he had not had anything to eat or drink. He had been beaten from the time he was arrested, and the abuse had not stopped up until this point. His clothes were, the, were not the robes of a king, they, but they were filthy and unkempt, stained with his own blood. His body did not smell like perfume, but rather the odor of the dungeon which he was forced to spend the night. His face was not groomed. It was bloodied and beaten from the beatings that took place. His beard was pulled out. He was not covered in gold, but rather the spit of men. And in order to mock him even more, Pilate posted a sign over his head that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, in John 19, 19. Now I'm going to try to compare this moment the best that I can, but I still won't do it justice. Imagine a beautiful model, okay? And this model has been burned profusely in an accident. And her once photogenic face is now scarred and difficult to look at. A face that was once placed on magazine covers and billboards is now a spectacle of pity. And envision her being forced to stand up in front of an influential crowd, a room packed full of people, and asked this question, are you a model? And for her to answer that question would be completely degrading and painful and shameful, wouldn't it? Yes. But the Lord faced an hour like this, but one that was much worse. But even so, in, in his humility, Jesus spoke the truth to Pilate and answered this question by saying, you are right in saying, I am a king. You see, the shame he experienced could not keep him from declaring, he is your king. He is your king. And he would willingly wear a crown of thorns before he would ever wear a golden crown made by man. And this humiliation is what he chose above any honor the world could give him. Hallelujah. Say, that's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. Amen. You see, life's treasures often disappear, and it seems like they're here one day and gone the next, but Jesus is the only one who is consistent. Aren't you glad he's consistent? Yes. The greatest advice any leader could receive would be to submit to the ruler of the nations, Jesus, and trust in him. With his help, the right solution is always available. And if we truly honor God, he will come through with provision every single time. And where Jesus is honored and obeyed, his kingdom operates. So what is the result of his rule in one's life? It is this, Romans 14, 17. It's very simple. What is the result of, the, of the, his rule over a nation, over one's life? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Simple, simple. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. How many of you all need some peace? Yes. How many of you all need some joy? Yes. How many of you all want to stay in righteousness? Yes. You've been made, made righteous through Christ Jesus. You have it. But honestly, a lot of times we put our righteousness on the shelf and say, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Well, that's a slap in the, in, in, that's slapping God in the face for what he did through Jesus. You are righteous. Yeah. And you need to tell yourself that I am righteous. I've been made righteous through Christ Jesus. What are the results of his rule over one's life? Does he rule over your life? Yes. Then this is a result. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. 
Romans 14, 17. These blessings are manifested as he reigns in our lives. Does everyone see this? Yes. Yes. But when a person or nation rejects him, the opposite is experienced. Immorality, war, and fear. Does this sound familiar? And Jesus explained the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Matthew 13, 44. The privilege of calling Christ your king is so important that he declared this in scripture. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Whoa. But it is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands and go into hell, where there fire does not go out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where there worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Whoa, that's heavy. Mark 9, 43 through 48 speaks of this. God is saying it would be better for you to go through the pain of removing your own hand, foot, or eye than to be separated from him for eternity. Whoa. The world's pleasure is worth nothing in the light of Christ's kingdom. I'm going to say that again. The world's pleasures is worth nothing in the light of Christ's kingdom. No earthly king is more important than Jesus. He is worth all we are and all we have. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And as king, he has the right and authority to judge good and evil. And he will make eternal decisions according to the faithfulness and the love that we have shown to him. I want us to read this next scripture passage with an open heart and a humble heart this morning. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelations 19. Revelations 19. We're spending time on the back of the book today. 11 through 16 is where we're at. Open your hearts. Humble your hearts to receive this this morning. To see this, to see this picture being painted by the word. Revelations 19, chapter 19, 11 through 16. I'll be reading this out of the NIV. Here we go. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. What is he called? Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that nobody knows but he himself. Pause for a moment. That intrigues me greatly. He has a name written on him, but nobody knows but he himself. It's a name that he has branded himself with. Nobody knows but he himself. It gives me goosebumps thinking about it. Whoa, that's cool. I would love to know more about that. I, the Lord hasn't revealed it to me yet. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. His name is the word of God. Hallelujah. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he's to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the wine presses of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say, that's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. Woo. Sounds like to me, he's covered in writings. He's covered in them. He has writings on him that nobody knows but he himself. And on his robe, this is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. On his thigh, on his person, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's covered in the word. He is the word. That's him. He is strikingly fierce and will judge and make war against the evil that opposes him. And he does not lose. <laughs> Amen. He does not lose. We're talking about the one who holds the universe in his hands. But I want us to notice from the above passage that he, he judges with justice. Everyone say, he judges with justice. Now, this means that whatever evil has been committed must be paid for by all individuals unless they find redemption through his blood. And that's the only way that it can take place is through his blood. His wrath is as perfect as his love. I'm going to say that again. His wrath is as perfect as his love. Right. My prayer today is that we, re we receive a revelation of Jesus, the judge, and it is a frightening thing to oppose him. The nations of the world will be judged on how they have treated the Son of God. Let me ask this question. Has his life, suffering, death on the cross, burial, and resurrection been honored, obeyed, and accepted, or has it been rejected and mocked? And as followers of Christ, we will stand before him and give an account of our lives. And this will be an incredibly intense moment when it comes in something to not be ignored. The Bible says this, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. You can just write that down. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, we're all going to be there. That at each one, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We'll be rewarded for the things that were good or bad. We'll all stand before this throne. Before his throne will be glass mingled with fire, it says. And it is worth mentioning that God himself is a consuming fire. The angels of heaven will witness this frightening scene when it takes place. And this will be an hour when we answer to God Almighty for what we have done in return for his love that was demonstrated toward us through Christ Jesus, his son. And we will be faced with questions that will reveal all the things that were more important to us than Jesus. The scripture says, for no other foundation, for no other foundation can anyone lay that, than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the only foundation. He's the only one. He is the rock of Gibraltar, okay? He is the only one that will stand. He is the foundation. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work for what sort it is. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 13. What is this saying? What is this saying? All of our methods, all of our motives, everyone say motives. motives. All of our motives will be revealed on this day. And we, will be judged, we won't be judged merely on the basis of what we did, but why we did it. And nobody will be standing with us when this happens. It will only be you and your eternal creator. No one else is going to speak on your behalf. And you will not receive a, a second chance to do things differently when this time comes. The Son of God declared, we have, we have no excuses. The Son of God declared in Matthew 12, 36 through 37. But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word that, ha that has been spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Wow. Not a single pastor, bishop, elder, priest, evangelist, church member will be exempt from providing this account. The highest ranking people in the church will have to face God. In fact, those who have taught God's people will be held at a higher standard, as James chapter 3 and verse 1 states. I fall underneath that category, Pastor Mike, Pastor Michelle, Pastor Denise, because we're preachers and teachers of the word. When we said yes to the call, we accepted all the results of that. Amen? We will be held at a higher standard because we teach and preach from the pulpit his children, God's people. Amen? Every hidden sin, if not repented of, that is the key. If not repented of, it's only through the blood of Jesus, only through the name of Jesus are we washed clean. We're spotless. I, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But every hidden sin, if not repented of, will be revealed as Romans 2 and verse 16 talks about. And when we see the scars on his hands and feet, we will have to explain why the things of this world meant more to us than the one who was pierced for us. Amen. No man or woman will be able to, to negotiate or lie to the all-knowing and all-seeing king of kings. His judgments are final and just, and it's only by surrendering our hearts to him that we do have a chance in pleasing him on that awesome day. I love the fact that we have this wonderful promise to hold on to. Y'all are like, give me the wonderful promise. This is heavy. Yeah. Yes. Jude 1, 24. Write that down. Jude 1, 24. Y'all are survive. Jude 1, 24, out of the NIV, it says, Unto him who is able to keep you from falling, yes. okay, to present you before his glorious presence, ah, without fault and with great joy. Did you know that's what Jesus, his full heart's desire is, is, is to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. That means you're spotless, you're clean. Nothing you have done has been remembered. It has been burned up in the fire in the presence of Almighty God because you have walked into the presence of God. You have accepted Jesus in your heart. You have lived for him. You have honored him and with great joy. That means he's going to have a smile on his face. That means you're pleasing to him. You're a sweet aroma unto him. And he presents you as a great and glorious trophy is the only thing I can think of honoring and just beaming with joy to his father. Look, look at my children. Look at this. Hallelujah. Jude 124, unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Thankfully, he is also called faithful and true. Aren't you grateful? Yes. 
that he is faithful and true. And he will reward us for our love and will honor us for honoring him. And he will give us all because we have done likewise. What you left on this earth in this lifetime to serve him is going to be rewarded a hundred times over. Think about that. If there's anything above Jesus, get rid of it and submit it to God. Amen. God wants you to have things. He wants you to find enjoyment. My passions are archery, hunting elk specifically. I love that. But if that's God, before God. That's a scary place to be. And I have to put that on the altar to be burned before Christ in order to use that and have fulfillment in that in my life. God wants you to have things. He wants you to have passions, desires. He put them there for a reason. But if they're God before him, no go. Amen. We have to submit those on the altar to be burned for him. And then he can allow us to find even greater joy in those when those things are used. Amen. What you left behind for him will be rewarded a hundred times over. And if we confess him before men, our family members, people on the street who we come in contact with, he will confess us before his father and the angels of heaven, as Matthew 10, 32 states. Jesus often let his disciples know that his time on earth was coming to an end and would suffer and die for the sins of the world. And even though he was seeking comfort in such trying circumstances, he didn't want his disciples to worry. So he told them this in John 14, 1 through 4. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Hallelujah. Imagine how beautiful our heavenly home must be if the Lord himself has gone to prepare this glorious place. Amen? What an awesome assurance that we have. He promises, look, I'm coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all the people according to their deeds. At Revelations 22 and verse 12. It will be an amazing sight to, to see Jesus coming on the clouds to take us to our true home. This is not home. We're about to enter our true home. Amen? Amen. Christ will return the same way when he died and rose again from the grave. The same Jesus will come on that precious day. Mark 13, 26. Don't, don't turn there. Mark 13, 26. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on clouds with great power and glory. Acts 1, 9 through 11 says this. Acts 1, 9 through 11. He was taken up to, into the cloud. While they were watching, the disciples were watching this take place, and they, uh, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. And just as Jesus was taken away in great majesty on the clouds, he will return with greater glory to receive us if we are his own, if we are his. Amen? And he will return visibly and all will see him. What a moment this will be when the Lord returns for his own. Amen? And this time he is not coming to die on the cross, but he is going to be ruling as a king. Church, every knee will bend in humble worship as we will view this breathtaking sight of Christ in all of his glory. Hallelujah. And we will finally experience what the Bible calls a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 11. All struggles will cease, all pain will end, all worry will disappear when we who love him will see the King of Kings. We will see Jesus face to face and be rewarded for our faithfulness and our labors and all of our suffering. And we will be reunited with our loved ones who live for him as well. How long will this last, you might ask? How long will this last? Eternity. Forever. His kingdom will never end. His rule is forever. Everyone say forever. forever. He will not look at the way he did when he suffered so greatly. He won't look that way when he suffered. He is the king. His heart has never changed. He will still be as loving as ever, yet his strength will be evident. He will be wearing a majestic golden crown, holy garments, yet his love will be the same as it was during his life on this earth. The same heart that said, here is my back for the whip, here is my face for the beating, here is my, cro here is my body for the cross, here is my life for your life. Say, that's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. 
The first and the last will be here soon. But in the meantime, let's obey and love him. And might I add, love one another. Amen? We must eagerly wait in expectation for his return. Yes, the world will suffer greater than we can ever imagine in the years ahead. But God assures us that he will rescue us from the wrath to come, as 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10 speaks of. Hallelujah. The scripture says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, with the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Can you imagine? Your grandma and grandpa are in Christ are going to go first. You're going to see them. And then it says, after that, these are ones in Christ, okay? After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will be the Lord. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Hallelujah. It says, and ends with this, therefore, encourage each other with these words. The word of God is to encourage one another. Amen. That's why it's so important to come together as the body to hear. Are you enjoying this? Yes. You, are you encouraged by this? Yes. He said, encourage one another with this. This is what's going to take place. I know it's hard in life sometimes. The struggle is real. Man, it's hard to overcome, but just you can do it. I'm with you. You can do it. Be encouraged. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. I want to end with this. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus talks about the story of the ten virgins, okay? Michelle preached last Sunday. It was amazing. She did an awesome job. She talked about having oil in her lamp, being prepared, okay? She mentioned this story. I want to emphasize on it because it's important. The five virgins were wise and five were foolish. The wise eagerly waited in expectation for the groom and prepared for his arrival. The fools did not in, wait in anticipation or faith for his coming. They were not prepared for him. So they panicked and attempted to ready themselves at the last minute. The bridegroom arrived while they were going out looking for oil to put in their lamps. What happened to the wise virgins? They were welcomed into the wedding banquet and the door was shut behind them. In contrast, the foolish virgins came back late and begged, Sir, please open the door for us. But the groom answered, I tell you the truth. I do not know you. They came to him when it was too late and they missed their moment. They could never have this opportunity to make things right again. What was missing? They did not truly know him. They did not truly know him, which kept them from watching the groom, watching for him. The groom in this parable represents Christ. Everyone say Christ. Christ. And those who love him and are living their lives in preparation for their beloved will go up with him. The door will be shut behind you and you're going to be in the banquet with him. Amen. Are you ready? Regardless of what your opinion is on the second coming, he is coming and he will return. So this morning, I want to ask you some simple questions. Do you really know him? Is there oil in your lamp today? Do you need oil in your lamp today? Am I living for him as I wait for his return? You see, if you're not looking for Jesus, you will be like one of the foolish virgins and will be unprepared and shocked by his arrival. If you are not ready, it will be too late for you. Regardless of how many times you plea, you will hear the Lord say these words, I do not know you. And that statement will be the most frightening thing, the most soul-crushing and spirit-ripping thing any individual will ever hear in their entire life for eternity. I do not know you. Your life will flash before you in a blink of a moment, and you will see all the chances you had to prepare yourself for his coming. You will not be able to say, I did not know what I was supposed to do, Jesus. You will have no excuse. With his heart breaking for those who said no to him, the righteous king, our king Jesus, will still have to punish evil. And he will mourn in the sight of so many who are not prepared for him. So let me ask you something. Are you ready? Are you ready for him? Is your eternity secure today? Loving and following him is the only way to prepare for this appointed time. I'm going to say that again. Loving and following him is the only way to prepare for this appointed time. So let's allow Christ to rule our hearts today. And let's ask him to be our king like never before. Amen. Wasn't that an incredible message? We're so glad that you tuned in today and you were able to join us at The Place Church where we love doing church as a family. Thank you so much for watching. You can connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, as well as going to our website at www.h2hm.org. You can find out all the different events, locations, and fun things that are coming up. We believe that when you partner with The Place, 
that you are seeing people reached and lives changed. All the information is also on your screen. Thank you so much for watching and know that we are believing for God's best in your life.